Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Good day, everybody. We kind of have a double dip for you today. First up is Lucinda from I Alley, and she's going to talk about her caregiving journey and what she created as a result. And then you may remember Matt from last summer. He's been on, but not released because we recorded an episode about his app. And then Lucinda decided it was so worthy of her scooping it up that we had to start over on this episode. So good afternoon, everybody. How are we doing? <laughs> Doing well. Good. Okay, like don't all talk at once now. <laughs> well, let's, let's, so the audience should remember Matt. So let's start with Lucinda. I understand that you became a caregiver at a very young age, like many of us, in a kind of an emergency. So if you tell us a little bit about your yes. journey. Sure. So I was super young, way too young to um, have any sort of education around what this might be like (laughs) and any, you know, infrastructure built um, that would help me provide this enormous uh, support for my father as well as myself. Um, you know, I was just sort of getting started in my own life and that I was, you know, just sort of getting my crap together uh, <laughs> financially and, you know, all of that. And then suddenly my father had several strokes and um, was kind of ignored by everyone in his life. And I was living in another state. So I finally got to see him and, you know, could tell that something was really wrong and had to really like grab the situation, you know, uh, and just take control. And I, I had, I just felt this switch, uh, go off inside me, you know, it was like, you're not the daughter anymore. You know, you, you, or at least you have to act like you're in charge and, and sort of fake that confidence because my dad didn't want to go to the hospital. I mean, he didn't want to go to the ER and it was, you know, of course it was the dementia talking, but he started saying things like, you don't love me. And, you know, don't touch me and you tricked me and stuff like that. So it was really traumatic and horrible. And I have a brother and a sister, but uh, it was just me. And, you know, of course, now I know that that's incredibly common, which but still is not an excuse. Uh, (laughs) I still don't get it at all. Um, But Basically, I I took the whole responsibility myself and um, just felt such a lack of support from, you know, hospital staff or his health insurance or even like his colleagues and his wife at the time. Uh, You know, everyone is very keen to just be like, okay, his daughter's here, like she's got it. Which is, you know, so um, once I, you know, really felt this lack of support and felt myself falling through the cracks, really, I thought, you know, there has to be other people out there like me. And of course, there are millions. And especially young, you know, young people, when it hits us at this stage, we're totally uneducated about it and just really not equipped to take on such a responsibility. So I decided to create something that has evolved into iAlly um, to really bring us all together, to share resources and support and 
um, just be there for each other. If, even if that's all we got, you know, we can have each other. So basically that's the long and short of it. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> I think it's about 25% of family caregivers. And this is probably, I think the number of family caregivers is actually an undercount, but at least sure. 25% of them are millennials, which my daughter is a millennial. Mm. And it makes me insane thinking about and the and the ones that I know who don't work because they're taking care of a mom or a grandmother. And it's like, does society not see what's going to happen here? Like, we, this is not this is not rocket <laughs> science. Like, I'm an artist. I was a photographer and I'm a podcaster. So I'm like, I don't do like math and statistics and that crap. You know, it's like, you know, I can multiply dollars when they, you owe them to me, but that's yeah. like the extent of my, uh, you know, math skills. But it's like, if you're not building your career and your retire, you know, and your personal wealth, buying a home, putting money aside for retirement, like thinking about that, it's like, I'm getting to that point. So I'm thinking about that, you know, yeah. it's like, and if something happens to you, then like, what the heck? You're not going to have any, there's going to be no financial background for you, somebody to help take care of you. I mean, it's like, can people not see this, like this storm that is about to just, you know, it's going to make COVID look like a walk in the park and it just kills yes, me. Yes, that is so true. It's like, we're, society is going to like cave in on itself. And how, how are, how isn't everyone freaking out about this? You know, this train wreck that is just like coming. Yeah, it's, it's scary. So tell us about I Ally, and then we're going to shoot it over to Max. I'm going to try to keep this from not being a two hour episode today. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, so, so I Ally, um, it's really the main uh, cornerstone of I Ally is the community. So, you know, one of the top uh, pain points that millennial caregivers experience is that isolation. Because, you know, we feel like something must be wrong with us because none of our friends are dealing with this. And, you know, we've been abandoned by our siblings or whatever. And so, that community, it really helps with isolation and provides peer support. And then just as extensions of that community, we have access to mental health, telehealth, um, and then just a ton of expert resources like financial coaching, um, all kinds of coaching, caregiver coaching, um, people who are specialists in dementia. And um, we have some legal counsel and really it, it sort of, I'm, I'm aiming, it, aiming for it to be pretty comprehensive. Um, so yeah, that's it, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> she says that's it, like that's just a small feat. Now I'm assuming you must have some sort of computer science background or? Did you just well? <laughs> <laughs> um, I I tried to like I I it was all self taught, um, which uh, you know I, if I could go back to school, um, I, I mean I I fancy myself a woman in tech, but um, but I I can't really do that like really granular work of coding and I wish that I could but um but I but I had enough awareness to know you know I was kind of obsessed with apps like um always I wanted to know what the new app was and product hunt was like my home page on the chrome browser and um so that was like the first thing I thought when I wanted to make iAlly. I thought I'm going to make an app. Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to make an app, but I'm sure it's not quite that simple. But Matt's done it. So why don't Matt, for the people who have yet to listen to your episode from last summer, 
And I don't know if we're going to pepper in any of the stuff that we recorded literally like less than 48 hours before your app got acquired by Lucinda and I ally. <laughs> it's like great timing, by the way. <laughs> Tell us about, about your that. background and why you decided to create your app and you can tell us the name of it again because i always pronounce it wrong so my background is actually in home care um when i was 12 my mom opened her first home care franchise um which has then led to now a couple of franchises and a small group home um where the group home is only about four people at a time ever since we opened it after covid and sort of took on uh, the challenges that nursing home faces and reduced it to a lot smaller, a lot safer um, environment. And it actually is a lot cheaper. So that's been nice. Um, That opens up here the next month. So we're excited about that. But uh, yeah, I started creating the Care Act app a while ago. Um, I really had no direction or any sense of where I would take it. Um, But I got an email actually it was in the last month or two and it was from Lucinda and it was to all the ILI members at the time. And it was thanking them for, it must've been for following for over a year now. And which is funny because I would have said I wouldn't have found it for another six months, probably last year, but I guess it must've been right before the pandemic where I found her just stumbled across her on social media somehow. I'm not sure if it was uh Twitter or Instagram or what, but um. Yeah, so I started following her about a year ago, and then recently, uh, once the Care Night app, uh, well, once the website started picking up traction, I reached out to her. I just said, "Hey, you know, like you're everything that I wish I could make this website and app. Um, is there any way I can get like involved somehow? Um, like I want to be acquired, but I want to work for you. Like your vision, like what you're doing, is what I wanted to do and what I wish I could do, but." it would take me five, seven years to get where she's at. Um, and she did it in a year and a half. So obviously like that was somebody that I wanted to work for. And, um, so now that's the game plan. Let's, uh, let's help her grow the community and let's see where we can take this. I mean, what the services and the things that she provides on the ILI app are truly just amazing. I mean, it's like what I wish I could offer every family caregiver. I mean, I've been in over a thousand homes in the last year or in the last five years just working in client care, uh, probably 10,000 now. I mean, in the last 10 years, I've probably been in about 10,000 homes, all in the Metro Detroit area that were all family caregivers. Now, most of them are millennials, but some of them are. And this is like what I wish I could have said to them when I walked in, like, hey, check out this app, like, look at these resources. I mean, we got everything, like, from community to financial aid to legal services to like everything loosened to said. I mean, it's just, it's literally just what I wish I could have made from the beginning with Care Night, And I'm just glad to be a part of it now. Well, I have one question for you because it came up yesterday, popped into a caregiver check-in clubhouse. And for those of you who are listening, that aren't familiar with clubhouse. It's another app. <laughs> so I'm a Gen Xer. So I'm like, almost hip with apps, but not quite, you know, it's like I had to be kind of drug into clubhouse a little bit, but there was a caregiver there that asked specifically what people used app wise. Cause I think, I think most of the people in the room yesterday were probably millennials or really young Gen Xers. I'm on the other end of that spectrum of Gen X. So And she's visually impaired and she was looking for an app that would basically journal, help her journal all the daily activities, you know, from, you know, when we get up, when the medications, what we've eaten, when we've toileted and all that stuff. Not a hundred percent sure why she was taking care of that or journaling that, but I do know that it can be important for a lot of people. So I don't know. I don't remember that Karenect does that so does i ally do that and if it doesn't now you have a possible ui that you might want to check into i will say i don't think it doesn't necessarily do that the same way now there are a lot of apps that already do that one thing i like about i ally is that we differ we're way different than anything else that's out there we don't try to we're not here to make money we're here to help people and that's not what most businesses are and 
that's okay with us. I mean, that's, I don't care about that stuff. It's helping people. It's the people that reach out to you and DM you that say, what you're doing has helped me so much is to me better than any sort of monetary gain that you can get. And it's why I love what I do. I mean, the last, we've only been working together now for like what, less than a month. And it has been the best month I've ever had. So thank you, Lucinda, by the way. Good to see you. (laughs) Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you. So how is the Care Connect app? How is it being integrated into iAlly? Is it right still going to be the... Yeah, right now I'm putting it on, on hold um, because iAlly is really, truly just that much better. Now, the Care Connect, the big part of that was the content and content creation, like the podcasts and blogs, things like that. And a lot of that we're going to roll into iAlly as we move forward, but it's not our main goal at the right current moment um right now we're really trying to grow the community and then as that grows we'll integrate certain things like your podcast things like that that we can bring in you know um but yeah the so care deck is still its own thing but it's sort of on the back burner in terms of the app wise but the website's still up um yeah and it's uh it's gonna be a great place more just for the content side of what we're trying to do so why don't you tell us more about the content lucinda Sure. Um, yeah, of course. Um, well, I mean, what I loved so much about Care Connect and what, um, what Matthew has done is the community that he is so tapped into and <laughs> has really just, he's so likable <laughs> and I mean, lovable and like he's able to talk to anyone in the community, which is so valuable when dealing with, you know, caregivers and people who are, who have so much stress and um, responsibility in in their lives. And um, I mean, in terms of content, it's funny because I love having all of the different voices and that's why community is so important is because I'm not, I'm not going to speak for everyone, you know, that would make no sense. So I love having all of the different voices, the different experts and the different opinions and, you know, experiences. And I do have my own things that I think need to be discussed and that I think can help people. But, but the best way for me to know what's going to help people is to actually interact with those people and, and figure it out. So I'm not going to sit here and write like how to be a caregiver, you know, that just, that would make no sense to me because I'm still figuring it out, you know, with, with everyone else. I don't I know if that relate. answers your question. It <laughs> yeah. does. I can relate because now my mom passed away March of 2020 and she had mm-hmm. Alzheimer's for 20 years. So she, I was like 32 when it was obvious she had a problem because I don't yeah. always think of myself as like a young caregiver because I wasn't really her caregiver until much later after my dad died. But I have learned so much from talking to other guests about their journeys, what they've learned, their bits of insight. I mean, I've learned so much since she passed away and it's like, okay, well, we're definitely keeping the podcast going because if I'm learning something and I talk to people all the time, then I know the listeners are going to get stuff out of it as well. And everybody's going to get, you know, what might be a big aha woohoo to me they might be like oh yeah i figured that out months ago but they might something that's obvious to you maybe is not obvious to them so i am totally right there with you about connecting with the community and it's just we need to be a bigger community i mean it's a big community but it seems like everybody's got their own little village like i didn't even know about the alzheimer's association until 2017 And I only found out about that because I was, it was after my dad died. I went to one of the hospice uh, grief support groups 
And I was like, well, this is only addressing half of my problem because the other half or even more than half is my dealing with my mother. And I wasn't sure how to do that because my dad refused help most of the entire time that he was alive. And I Googled it. I Googled like Alzheimer's support group. And that's how I found the Alzheimer's Association. Now I'm an advocate and I, you know, they suck you right in, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then after I did the podcast, I've learned about all these little like tribes. And it's like, we need like one big community with all these different pieces. And I know there's people working on that. It's kind of one of my dreams to have like an entire media ecosystem where you can get everything you need for, you know, support for caregivers, entertainment for older adults, older adults with cognitive impairment. And there's people working on that. It's very slow, <laughs> but hopefully, you know, that'll happen because part of caregiving should not be searching out the information. That's why yeah. I started the pod podcast versus writing a book, which I always say is still on the back burner, but I don't know if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, I'm not going to, not going to lose sleep over it because I wanted information to be accessed easily while you're doing other things. Yes. And well, the one in podcast too, I mean, I'm oh, sorry, listen to the sorry. <laughs> podcast, Jennifer. I mean, there's a good chance I'm not here right now having this conversation with Lucinda and you guys. I mean, your podcast was the first one that, and this isn't me just buttering you up, it was the first one that helped give me <laughs> the idea between you two actually in this conversation, um, finding Lucinda online, seeing that I could be, you know, a founder or do something caregiver related and make it a living. And then seeing your podcast and how well that's grown over the last year and that there's actually just content being created for caregivers. I mean, it was kind of like the blend of, you know, two different storms that really helped push me to doing what I did and then ultimately leading us here. So, I mean, this is a, it's a really cool conversation to be on with you guys. Oh, fun. I did not know that. <laughs> Man, yeah, this was the that... first podcast I ever saw that was even, or like first content that was ever really related to caregiving. So I thought that was really cool. And it wasn't, it's not just all focus on the boring stuff like you have light side like you <laughs> it's, it's, it's not it's not just like okay this is how you do a transfer like it's it's more than that and that's what i love yeah you can watch videos and stuff on a lot of that and that wasn't I, my original goal was to impart the wisdom that i had learned <laughs> and my very first podcast that i recorded was so bummer my husband listened to it and he goes oh my god that's so negative and I was like, but it's such important information. And then I listened to it and I was like, oh yeah, that is, I'm not sure I'd want to listen to that. And I've been a podcast listener since before iPods. Now I'm dating <laughs> myself again. When you had to like keep, like if you had it on your phone, it was through websites. And if your phone went to sleep, the stupid podcast would stop. It was really annoying. <laughs> and I was also, listened. It doesn't know this, but I was a photographer until COVID. That was, that was the end of dealing with, you know, that, that career. Plus I'd done it for 30 years wow. and I would listen to podcasts while I retouched portraits, but playing a podcast through your web browser while you're using Photoshop makes your computer go eh, choke. <laughs> <laughs> like, honey, please, we need more RAM for this crap. So it wasn't until after they, they came out with the podcast apps because I kind of faded out of listening to them because they were just almost more trouble than they were worth. And then they came out with the podcast apps and I started listening to them that way. It was much better. But when I started my, before I started the podcast, the reason I got the idea is in late 2017, I was at the gym and I went, oh, duh, I should look for a podcast on caregiving. There's podcasts on everything else. Like, like the most abstract topics you could possibly imagine. And I, mm -hmm. because I'm older and need glasses to read on my phone, I went home and go did it on my computer so I could see. <laughs> and there was one and she's been around a long time. She's got a great thing going, but it was just not my flavor. Mm -hmm. And I crazily decided to start my own. So kind of like Lucinda and Matt and a lot of the caregivers I talked to, I don't know, where they seem compelled to like, oh, well, it's not like caregiving wasn't enough work. Let me write a book or create an app or <laughs> there's always something that's like, I'm just amazed at the oh. creation that comes out of this journey that many, many of us are on. So let's go back to iAlly and we, we got its origin story and it's, 
Do you have any like success stories you want to share with us? Sure. Um, well, that's so funny what you said. I, I think that is why that was the flavor to use your word that I wanted with I ally was like, there's nothing out there for young people who are dealing with this and all of the very like formal you do this this is how you do this like everything was so formal and had no personality of course I had not discovered you um (laughs) but yeah so I I was that stuff I, I was like there has to be something that speaks to like us, you know? <sighs> um, so, um, so yeah, I'm thankful that people are, want to create their own stuff because we're the only, you know, we're the people who, who get it. Um, anyway, uh, oh my gosh, what was your question? <laughs> oh my oh, you're, you, That's okay. I have the same problem. You start answering a question and that brain cell dies. <laughs> So yeah, right. Side note, when I was in college, I had a night class with an instructor who would talk, 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 blah, 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 blah. And you're furiously taking notes as we do in college. And then he'd literally like stop and he'd think and he'd be like, well, that brain cell died. And then he'd go off on another topic and it'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Is that going to be on the test? <laughs> you didn't finish talking about that topic. And it was so frustrating. And I, I think about him because oh. I wonder was it just end of the day and he just he just kind of went off a little bit on a tangent and lost his train of thought? Or was that actually an early sign of, you know, a neurological yeah. disease? And I don't even remember his name because I'm horrible with names. So <laughs> and it's been a few years. But yeah, I always kind of wonder about him. But you were going to tell us some um, positive oh, stories or some. Uh, yeah. Success right. stories. There we go. See, even I lost the word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I do have a really good one uh, because it really involves the whole sort of like attitude of I ally, which in addition to, you know, we, you know, wanting content that is more friendly to just people, young people, or more just, I don't know, just out there people. I don't know. Um, I also, you know, I felt super angry for a while, like very, you know, very angry at my family that I felt like abandoned me. And I felt, you know, all the times I had to sort of protect my dad because he has aphasia and dementia. So he has a lot of trouble communicating. So I just spent so much time. i feel like defending him or protecting him. And so I just felt very like, you know, F you to, (laughs) to, I don't know, many different layers of people or whoever. And so that was part of, of I ally was, was taking power back for, for all of us collectively And there was a a young woman who was actually her boyfriend's caregiver. And she was trying to file for disability insurance because of his mental illness. And his doctor would not release his medical records to her, even though she was power she had power of attorney and healthcare proxy and all these things and so we were talking and i was like i you know i like doing all this research furiously and and i was like call the hospital that this doctor is you know affiliated with and she was like i have and they all they did was say yeah we have a lot of complaints about this doctor <sighs> okay that's helpful i know it was like And I just couldn't help but think, you know, they're brushing off this girl because she's young and she's a woman. And they're, and also because her boyfriend is mental, probably because he has a mental illness. I mean, all these things have like stigma, you know, and I'm sure that they just, 
no, they're just not listening to her, taking her seriously. And that just makes me enraged. (laughs) So, um, so I was like, what is, you know, what can we do? What can we do? And then I realized it, I guess maybe because it was during the pandemic, um, you could file, uh, like a, a civil rights complaint, um, or it was the office of civil I can't even say it correctly anymore, but it was a HIPAA violation. So, you know, going above the doctor, going above the hospital, going above, you know, everyone, everyone to the highest level and filing like a HIPAA violation against this doctor. And it felt really awesome. (laughs) And 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 made me feel and and her too obviously together we felt so like finally pow- powerful finally it's like whew, makes me emotional because it, you feel so disempowered as a caregiver and this was just like a big win for caregivers everywhere Well, that is a fantastic story to hear because I have a follower on Twitter who is a very big dementia advocate. She lives with FTD, frontal temporal dementia, Mm -hmm. and she has had breathing issues and the doctor recommended a breathing machine and the insurance company went, yeah, no. And they've just been fighting and fighting and fighting. They finally get appointment with her for the doctor Of course, the doctor should know that she's got FTD. I mean, it is her doctor and they won't let her husband go back in the exam room with her and she's signing papers and she has no clue what she's signing. And it just like the entire thing was a disaster. And I guess he talked to an attorney and he pretty much got the whole, eh, not much we can do. And she's got a pretty, you know, pretty tight knit following. And I'm like, if we have to rain holy hell down on your insurance company or this doctor's office, I'm like, let's mo- mobilize your followers on Twitter to just rain fire down on these people. She did not take us up on it. I was not the only uh, one suggesting it. But uh, first, here's my opinion. I truly believe we need to change the way doctors are trained. But that's a whole, like, probably a generational change. Doctors are trained to fix us, to heal us, fix broken bones, cure diseases. They can't cure things like FTD or brain damage from a stroke or like my mom's Alzheimer's. So they get to a point where it's like, I can't fix your person. Why are you here? I don't think they actually think that. I just think it's like an internalized feeling, but there's women in my support group, my Alzheimer's support group who have gone through the same thing. It's like all of a sudden, their normal family doctor retires because, you know, those things do happen. They get a new doctor. The new doctor is really nice. They go for some reason to the doctor and, oh, no, 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 you can't come back here with your husband because, you know, we have to make sure that there's no abuse going on. Like, there's going to be abuse because I'm about to kill this doctor. You know? <laughs> That's probably what I would have said, but it was yeah. like, I mean, I, I um. get that, but it's like he can't answer questions and you're going to ask him questions and he's going to say, oh, I feel fine. And then you're going to go out in the waiting room and go, well, he says he feels fine. He's like, yeah, no kidding. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So right. it's just like, holy hell. Yeah. But I did not know that you could do, you know, when I think of a HIPAA violation, I usually think that, I don't know, I don't think about it in that context. So I'm going to send her a DM because that sounds like an important thing to know. Yes. And she's like, she's waking up in the middle of the night gasping for air. I'm not sure why she did have COVID and I'm not really sure what's going on. Cause you know, at Twitter, there's not, there's not enough characters for a whole lengthy description mm. of what's happening, but it's like, how about we just give her what she needs and then keep evaluating. And if, if this is, she really doesn't need this equipment, then say, well, okay, the insurance is only going to pay for X because you know, it's not helping or whatever. It's not related you know, but she's waking up in the middle, like gasping for breath. And it's like, if you're not getting enough air to feel like you're breathing, you know, it's not doing your brain any good. Just right. like, you know, it's another one of those things. It's like, 
can we not see the obvious? Like, is yeah. it just okay just to let her suffer and then like, I don't know, die faster because we don't want to provide a breathing machine? Ugh. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> it just kills me. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know. It's these communication breakdowns. It's like the doctor doesn't, well, okay. Uh, I guess I, I won't speak for every doctor, obviously, but the doctor doesn't want to take that extra time and effort to talk to the caregiver when the caregiver has all, I mean, especially if you're, if there's, if someone has dementia, I mean, the caregiver has the intel, you know, the caregiver can, is going to say what's up and that, oh God, that just makes me really angry. Yeah, my mom's neurologist was very good at taking the time and, you know, I mean, we would spend probably at least half an hour talking to her and she was really good. I don't know. This was probably a skill that she ta taught herself. She would talk to my mom, look at my mom and listen to me. So she like her back could be to me. And I knew she was paying attention to me because my mom would just go off with gibberish answers. If they were actual okay. real words and somebody that wasn't trained in Alzheimer's would not necessarily be aware that she was as advanced in the disease as she was. Obviously this doctor did, but like her general physician would ask my mom questions and I would try to quietly give him the correct information and then he'd kind of look at me and like, look at her and you'd be, you could almost see that he was like trying to blend the two answers together to get the truth, quote unquote, finger quotes for those people that look at this video. And it was so frustrating. I mean, he was a nice guy, but it was like, I'd always have to remind them she has advanced Alzheimer's. They'd want to do it, you know, a urine test check for a UTI and they'd hand me the specimen cup. I'm like, we've been through this. You know, this doesn't work this way. Like, first off, she gets really combative and there is no way in heck I am getting in that personal a position because I don't know that she won't clobber me over the head and knock me on the floor. Fortunately, I'm not, you know, I work out, I'm pretty strong, but, you know, I'm not kneeling on the floor to do things in the bathroom that aren't really what any of us want to do. And I'd yeah. have to remind them every single time. I'm like, open her freaking chart and look at it. Oh, yes, we need to do the urine test this way. And then just don't frustrate everybody. It's like so stupid. I'm like, why is it that you insist on frustrating four people in a matter of three minutes? Because that makes sense. It was just like, ugh, so irritating. The Alzheimer's yeah. Association is working on legislation, the California version right now. And the way California goes, generally the rest of the country goes. So you can thank us for this one. Is they're going to, they're trying to require... Of the 50 hours of continuous education for doctors, that four of them be specifically on Alzheimer's. So it's not adding to their workload. Now that's four hours. The 50 hours is over two years. So you're talking like two hours of training this year, two hours of training next year. So it's like a really low bar ask. Yeah. And I was really super encouraged that when we did our little Zoom advocacy day, that one of the legislators that we spoke to, my team, he's in Southern California. I'm in Northern California. I don't know if you knew that. They he he was like, now wait, it's only four hours over two years, and it's it's part of the fifty. And I'm like, yes, that's what the bill says. And he goes, I think it should be more. And I'm like, yes. I'm like, I completely agree with you. But this is what the bill says, and this is what we're asking you to support. So, I mm. I see movement, and. There, some of the legislation that's been passed has been on getting them paid through Medicare to take the time to do cognitive screenings every year on people, I believe at 65 and older, to do to take the time and to get paid for the time because that's our problem. It's like doctors have to crank through patients to be able to pay the bills and, and make enough money to live and pay off their student loans. I mean, it's just the whole system yeah. is a disaster. We got to like rethink the whole program. <laughs> which as yeah. we know is really simple to do. <laughs> so what's been your experience with iAlly thus far, Matt? You're very passionate about joining the team. So you've been sitting there quietly nodding your head. <laughs> I mean, it's just been nothing but 
great. I mean, honestly, uh, I spent all weekend with family that I haven't seen in, I mean, years really. Uh, and yeah, I mean, basically they probably were all sick of me talking about how much I loved it with a smile on my face, but what was cool was that so many of my cousins who I don't talk to on the regular came up to me and just said, you just seem so happy. Like we're happy for you. And I, you know, that was, that's been the best part of this is that just like caregivers, you know, doing something for caregivers, you feel very alone. And I'm sure this in about the same way. It was just like, half the reason why Karen and I never really took off is because I never had the vision that she had, but I also was scared to do a lot of things by myself. You know, am I really going to put myself all the way out there for this? What if this fails? I mean, I failed at a lot of different things, so that's not really something that scares me, but it's more of if I get bigger and fail, like how does how do I feel or whatever the case may be. Um, but all of a sudden now I don't feel that way. I don't feel alone because now I feel like I have a team. I have I have that community, but more than that, I have a teammate and I have a leader who believes in me. And, you know, I've always worked for my family, so like I'm not going to say I've never had that feeling before, but it's different when someone actually understands you and understands your vision and understands like what you're talking about. And even if they don't, they say, I want to see what happens, go for it. Like, that's a feeling that I've, I've never really had. So it's been honestly just like a dream come true. I mean, this last month has been the best. And like I told this in mean, I would go to war for her. Like she's the type of leader that the type of person that like, once you find that like, you don't like I'll 30 years from now, I'll still be here. You know what I mean? Like type of person. So it's, um, it's been awesome. The best month has just been the best. So thank you. Listen to that. That's it's been the best. But like, that makes me emotional because I, cause exactly what you said, like, I, it's, it is, I've been just a one person team for so long and and to find someone i mean as a founder or a ceo or whatever you can hire someone that like does xyz but you can't find you can't hire like the passion and the like sharing the same like convictions and commitment and i mean <laughs> I'm just, I feel so lucky. I feel the same way. Like to, to have a team, it's just, it's everything. You can relate to the one, the, the one woman team kind of deal. This, at the end of 2020, I joined a podcast community, like a, a coaching and acceleration community. And that's really nice, even though well, I'm the only one that's on caregiving and everybody's got very different topics, but we're all kind of in the same boat. So it's kind of fun. And you just have that connection. And I think connections are really important, especially after last year, kind of realize how much you need them. Yes. So that sounds like a really important part of where I ally is and is going. So tell us what your plans are for the rest of 2021. I almost always say 2020 because even though <laughs> we're, we're like, stuck there. <laughs> I know it's like, it's like the year that never happened, but never ended. So <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Some weird vacuum. Oh, so what's um, your vision going forward? So definitely, like you said earlier, um, a, a community that is bigger, that, I mean, that's why I didn't, you know, people would ask, are you starting in New York or are you starting in, you know, Texas and New York or whatever? And I was like, no, this, this is global. I mean, it, cause it's, it's really, it's diagnosis agnostic. So it's like any caregiver for anything. I mean, we experience the same struggles and stressors. So the experience is the same. And it's funny because people outside of caregiving don't get that. They're like, no, you need to have like this and this and this. And I'm like, no, man, like we just want, like we all just want to be like together. And so that's really what the vision is, is to create that much bigger community 
that has people in all the different niches, but uh, really, so we can, you know, all be enabled to live healthy, you know, happy, fulfilling lives while also, you know, fulfilling caregiver duties. And really that's the ultimate goal. Not a simple goal, but definitely worthy. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you going to yes. do with them, Matt? You're going to keep work. What's what's your what's your role again? So chief marketing officer. Basically, um, my goal for this year is grow the community. And then as the community grows, we'll find even more resources and partners to team up with. And then, yep, I mean, we grow the community, grow the resources grow the caregiver basically is the game plan. Wow. I like that. <laughs> That's good. I like it too. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm excited to be a small part of the team. However, I can help. And I look forward to learning more about you guys and what you're doing and, and sharing your community with mine and bringing them everybody together. So we're not separate little communities talking at each other. Yes. I love that. Thank you. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.